Now, a special pleasure for all tech lovers among us because Brian Merrick is our next speaker. Brian was first exposed to the functional style in 1983 when the accident of knowing a little bit of Lisp tossed him into a job of technical lead on a project to port common lips to a new defunct project architecture. That led him to reading spree about all things Lisp, the language from which the functional style arguably originated. He's been a language geek ever since, despite making most of his living as a software process consultant. He's the author of the popular Mitch testing library for Conjure and has written books like Everyday Scripting with Ruby or Programming Cocoa with Ruby and Functional Programming for the Object-Oriented Programmer. The two books in progress are An Outsider's Guide to Statically Typed Functional Programming and Lenses for the Mere Mortal. So, welcome, Brian. Can we hear you? Yep, you there? thank you. Good, welcome again. Nice thank to you. have you here. I know that you were supposed to come here in Belgrade, just like most of the speakers, and we are very sorry that it didn't happen, but hopefully next year will be uh, better in that sense and that you can show you all the beauty that this city has. So today we are, you are here with us uh, with a topic on navigating your personal adoption of functional programming, right? Yes. Okay, just to make sure before you start uh, and to tell everyone that after this session, Bran has a Q&A on the Agile stage. So use Q&A section within Matchabout to ask Bran as many questions as you like. And then after this session, go to the uh, <clears throat> to Agile stage and uh, Brian can answer all your questions then. Okay. Okay. I'm okay, we can start. start. Thanks. Okay, so now we officially start the talk. I'm going to show an example of what is the core idea behind functional programming. So I'm using a language that is somewhat similar to Elixir. And if we type at the Elixir interpreter, something like this, make incrementer equals, that is a variable assignment and works the normal way. Elixir is a dynamically typed language, so we could assign anything we wanted to make incrementer. What we turn out to assign is a function, and you can tell it's a function by seeing the little keyword there, fn, followed by the argument list to the function, which is value to add. Okay, then Brian, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but you're not sharing your screen, your presentation with us. Very good. Um, share screen, share. Okay, great. Uh, so... Okay. okay, that's that's good. Perfect. Start actually starting over. Um, so we're creating this function called uh, make incrementer, or that's to say we are assigning a function to the variable make incrementer or having the variable make incrementer point at a function. And we can tell it's a function because of the way the expression looks with fn in the beginning. And uh, when we finish typing that, the interpreter will print out some fairly obscure thing that says we have an actual function. So now that we've got a function, we can use it in the same way as any other function. So I haven't told you what make incrementer does, but what it is, is it's a function that takes an argument, in this case five, and returns another function, which I'm going to name by underscore five. And then when you use by underscore five and apply it to three, you get the value eight. So make incrementer is a function that makes an incrementer function. And here's what the incrementer function looks like. And what's interesting about this is we're, we're returning a value that is a function and somehow the value that is that function is able to hang on to the variable value to add. So uh, in the introduction, uh, the host said that I started learning Lisp in 1983, which is true. So that was about 38 years ago. I was a C programmer at the time. 
if you know C, C has function pointers, but a function in C is something the compiler makes from text you wrote into a text file and compiled. This notion of being able to just create a function during the execution of your program was just magical to a C programmer uh, back in those days, especially this whole thing where somehow the function still had access to the values of variables that were just hanging around when it, um, when it was created. And the disappointing thing, I guess, is that now, 30, eight years later, that's completely boring now because then only weird languages like Lisp had this ability. Now, completely mainstream languages like Java, like I assume C Sharp, like JavaScript, all of those things can do this kind of creation of functions uh, on the fly rather than only by the compiler. And so the question then is what's left, what's interesting now, 2021, about functional programming? And the interesting things about functional programming no longer have much to do with functions per se, uh, because all languages can do things with functions. Now the interesting things are various features that tend to be found in functional programming languages, but tend not to be found in mainstream programming languages like your JavaScripts, like your Javas, though they are tending to get included. I'm gonna talk about one of them, one of the features that most functional languages have, and that many people think is an incredibly important part of functional programming. And that's the distinction between mutable and immutable data structures. So I'm gonna talk about mutable data structures, meaning changeable data structures, like ones that are available in uh, Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, so on and so forth. Here we have a variable, which I've named mine, and that variable is pointing to an array. It's a seven element array. And if I wanna change the second element of mine to be a check mark, then I type something like mine square bracket two square bracket equals check mark. And that results in the second element of the array pointed to by mine being changed to a check mark. Where this gets confusing is if some other variable somewhere else in the program uh, is pointing to that same array and from some other code somewhere else and that other code doesn't expect that array to be changed, you've now introduced a bug. And people who talk about functional programming languages talk a lot about uh, how mutability leads to bugs. And the alternative to uh, mutable data structures is immutable or unchangeable data structures. And here we have an example of that. We've got some, vari some variable, some other variable, and mine, they both point to a seven element array. The equivalent of changing the second element in a functional language will typically be something like array.put into the array mine at the index to a check mark. The name is actually not a very good name, because it doesn't change the array. Instead, in all cases uh, with immutable data structures, you first make a copy. So array.put first makes a copy of the original array, and then it puts the check mark in that copy. So all changing in a functional language 
is copying and then making a making the change to the copy. So there is no uh, variable that can be pointing at the original array that can be confused by this change because it can't see the change. It doesn't have a pointer to the new array down at the bottom. So no existing pointer can become, become confused about what it's pointing at. Uh, in fact, nothing here, since I didn't, in the line array.put, since I didn't assign the result of array.put to a variable, uh, this array is pointed to, the new array is pointed to by nothing, which means that the garbage collector is gonna come around at some point and uh, collect that and it'll be as if it was never created. So that's immutable data structures. And if you, a lot of people who propose functional programming language say that there are bugs due to mutable data structures, which is true, and that those bugs are a big, huge deal, which I don't think is true. That is, there are many other sources of bugs in your programs that are more common than bugs due to mutable data structure. So getting rid of those bugs is nice, it's fine, it's useful, but really, it's not that big a deal. So I've been programming exclusively in a functional language for uh, 11 or 12 years. Obviously, I like programming in functional languages. I think I make fewer bugs in functional languages. I think that I am more productive in a functional language, but we're talking about improved percentage improvements. I'm not doubling my productivity or anything like that. Uh, by way of comparison, I started doing test-driven design about 22, 23 years ago. And the effect of test-driven design on my productivity and on my ability to write working code is far greater than that um, I've gotten from programming exclusively in functional programming languages. So I think functional programming languages are useful. I think to some extent, they've been made to seem more important than they are. So I wanna put that in context here. There is one distinction worth making. Uh, one thing we've learned in the 70 or so years that we've been writing programs is that when it, writing asynchronous or concurrent programs with threads is just too hard for ordinary human beings to do, especially in the case where you've got data shared between threads that can change. So the functional programming languages have generally combined immutability with different ways of handling concurrent programs that I think if you have highly concurrent programs, if you have a lot of promises or threads in your programs, probably the value of functional programming will be somewhat greater. So I'm not gonna talk about all of these different things inside uh, on this page, but I have made slides for them and I was going to talk about them. Uh, there's simply not enough time. so. We can pause and look at these slides about how two different programming languages, functional programming languages, use uh, handle mutable state and concurrency and asynchronous processing and such. I'm showing this 
to encourage you uh, to say that if you are interested in these features of functional programming languages, uh, ask me in the question and answer session, and I probably have uh, some slides I can show you in addition to whatever other questions you wanna ask. So what I'm gonna talk about in this talk, rather than any more features of functional programming languages, are how to learn them. So if you're gonna pick a language to learn, what to look for as you pick that language, I'm gonna give you six safe languages to pick from. Um, I'm not going to say at this point what I mean by safe, but I will say that later personal strategies for learning and then finishing up with company strategies, where if a company wants to have adoption of functional programming languages, how they might go about it. So uh, I'm going to look at five different issues or areas or questions to ask when picking a functional language. I'm not gonna read through this slide because the rest of the slides are all about that list. So. A first question you wanna ask is about learning styles. Are you the sort of person who likes to learn by systematically building concepts or through just-in-time learning? What I mean uh, by the distinction is kind of captured by this quote by Colin Yates, who is, has, is now a Rust programmer and he says uh, that he did his usual, you read the book quickly, it gets started, uh, you're doing okay, so now let's leave the book behind and do a giant application. And he says that didn't work for him and for Rust. Then he says, I did the grown-up thing and now it's pretty smooth. What he meant means by the grown-up thing is build concepts systematically. This is the way that you are typically taught a programming language. And I like to think of it as being, for some reason, my nice slide didn't, there it is. Um, it's something like learning uh, particular topics in mathematics in a college course. So 42-ish years ago, I took a course in set theory and metric spaces, still have the book. Here is page five. Page four defined a set. Page five is defining intersection and union, the very basic set operations. This book does what many math books do. It now describes some theorems, describes and then proves those theorems. And then it gives definitions of new concepts that are built on the old concepts, gives theorems for those. And pretty soon you're up around page 80 and all of a sudden you're reading and understanding theorems that use words like metric spaces and complete sets and descending sequences of sets and non-empty sets and so on and so forth. So that's the gradual systematic approach uh, that a lot of programming books teach. Another alternative is the way that I learned Clojure uh, 11 or 12 years ago. Clojure is a functional programming language. I'll talk more about it later. Uh, I went in there, I read a book on closure, basically skimming over the parts where it's a programming language like every other programming language, looking at the parts that were special, making a mental note to understand them more fully if I needed them. And then I went off and I wrote a unit testing framework for closure because I didn't like the one that came with closure. So that turned out to be a fairly substantial project. Uh, it's modestly heavily used open source software. I learned a lot of things doing that by going back to the books and the documentation when I ran into a problem. The reason that I mentioned this is that it is, uh, there are some languages for 
for which that style of learning, just-in-time learning, the kind that I frankly prefer, is just a really, really bad idea. So I'm going to point out the languages where you need to get a book and you need to work through that book systematically. Um, functional programming languages like non-functional languages come in statically typed varieties like Java, C Sharp, all those languages. They come in dynamically typed varieties like JavaScript or Ruby or Python or what have you. If you have a strong preference for one style of language, probably you want to learn a functional uh, programming language that's in that style. So if you like dynamically typed, take a look at a dynamically typed functional language. I will say that if you are, if you don't care much, I would tend to lean toward the statically typed languages because the type systems in functional languages are strictly more powerful than you'll find in something like Java. They are uh, often less annoying than something like what you'll find in Java because they don't make you type out the type declaration if the compiler can already figure it out. So there's less busy work typing than there is in something like Java. And the type systems are just inherently interesting. Um, there are some languages that are written to run in the browser, some languages that are written to run on the server. If you're not doing a web app, I'm sort of including all programs uh, that don't talk to the web as being backend programs. So if you're in, if you're a JavaScript programmer, you probably want to look at a at a front end language. If you never ever want to know anything about JavaScript or the browser, pick a back end language. Um, third thing to look at is a uh, whether the functional programming language is a whole product as opposed to just a language in its compiler. Now, ever since the 1950s, people have divided uh, have divided people adopting a new technology into five distinct groups. Generally, uh, it takes time for the, well, let me actually back up, explain the two most important groups from my point of view. Uh, this group is a group of people called visionaries. They're people who will adopt a technology early on in its life cycle, and they're adopting a technology because they think it'll be a huge, fantastic success. Uh, for example, there was a point at which IBM Research, I believe, invented this new thing called a relational database. There were actually people who said, we're going to build a product built on top of relational databases because that we think that is going to be a give us huge power that our existing databases don't give us. And I believe in this case, it was the first really automated airline reservation system, uh, Sabre. And they thought we can really, really win big if we try out relational databases. And visionary people are prepared to put in a great deal of work in order to get that huge win, even though that means they'll have to debug the technology because it doesn't work. They'll find bugs in the relational database system. If you're learning a programming language as a, vi as a visionary, you'll expect that the compiler will have bugs in it and you're willing to work around those bugs and to write good bug reports and so on and so forth. Uh, you'll expect to build support tools. There'll be things it doesn't come with. If your language is uh, 
a visionary style language, it might not have a package manager. It might not have configuration files that teach your favorite editor how to do syntax highlighting for this language because nobody's written them yet. If you want them, you may have to write them. Uh, you can't hire people to help you with it because nobody knows about it. Whoops. And this package of things, you know, technology that really works, support tools, um, all of those things can be missing, but you're willing to put up with it because of the huge win that you can expect. Uh, after some point of time, the product becomes something that it's safe for pragmatists to use. Now, pragmatists are people who are expecting modest improvements, 10% instead of 10 times improvement. And what I've said is that's, that's what you should expect from functional programming languages normally, unless you're a particularly odd case. If you're a normal case, a normal company, you expect some improvement, but not enough improvement that you're willing to put up with all of what the visionaries do. So you are entitled to expect no compiler bugs or compiler bugs that are so rare that it's a, a major occurrence when you discover one. You should expect from a programming language, a package manager, unit test framework, editor plugins for all the popular editors, so on and so forth. The other thing that characterizes uh, pragmatists is they want references from other pragmatists. They want to go to another pragmatist and have that pragmatist tell, tell them, we used Clojure to produce an application and it worked fine. They want reassurance that if they start a project, start a new application with um, a functional programming language that if the project fails, it won't be because of the language they chose, it'll be because of the other reasons that products, that apps, that projects fail. Most often you didn't build the right thing for the right people. So that's what I mean by safe languages. The six languages I'm gonna introduce are ones in which um, the, a project you build using it will not fail because of the language you picked. Ah, uh, blast. Uh, they expect good documentation. Typically, pragmatists expect books, courses, people you can hire to teach the courses, consultants to come in and give you help in producing this. That's what's meant by a whole product. Now, all of the languages I'm going to talk about are safe languages. Some of them have better, more complete, more polished whole products than others. And so I'll tell you which those are. Um, one thing when you're looking at the products, what I uh, recommend is that you take a look at the web framework that comes, that is associated with the language. Most languages will have one. Because the web is so popular, that's probably the most developed part of the whole language ecosystem. So if the web framework is in good shape, that's a sign that everything's in good shape. If the web framework has pieces missing, has weak documentation, that's probably a good sign that there are problems elsewhere. And if you're sensitive to that, you might wanna choose a different language. Orientation is the final one. And this is awkward to define uh, because if you go on Twitter or what have you, and you hear 
people talking about programming language communities, you'll hear people say that language is community is unfriendly. And another person will say, what do you mean that's an unfriendly programming language community? I'm in it, it's great. I think everyone there is very friendly and helpful. And so friendly and not friendly is not a good distinction. Every language community, every human community is friendly to the kind of people who fit in that community and is unfriendly to people who are awkward fits. So it's not the community that you need to, to worry about, it's how well you fit into whatever kind of community that is. And I have three things that I like to look at if I'm investigating a, pro a programming language community. One, and this is fairly new, is how good the error messages from the compiler are. Um, there are languages that are known for having really good error messages. Elm is one, uh, Elixir is another, and Rust is a third. And this attitude, the attitude in Rust and those other languages is that if there is a hard to understand error message, then that's a bug in the programming whole product and they want to fix it. Other people think an error message is, making an error message more clear is not that important. Those languages tend to be less friendly to beginners, and I tend to argue uh, less good languages in the long run. Documentation is another good thing to look at. Uh, I like to focus in not on the official language documentation, but go to the languages package manager, find some of the popular packages that lots of people use and look at their documentation because that shows you uh, the general community wide or how important the general community thinks documentation is. And if you're someone who likes to read documentation and likes helpful documentation, you'll want to gravitate toward languages that have good documentation and have a culture of good documentation. I like looking at um, the issue tracker for the language's compiler uh, or the language itself. Uh, if Do people file bugs against documentation? Do people get those bugs fixed? I have filed two bugs against the documentation of Elixir. And in both cases, almost immediately, I got an enthusiastic response to the person who's mainly responsible for Elixir. And that made me feel this is a friendly community, part of the reason why I use Elixir. Um, the other, uh, other thing to look at is kind of delicate, Programmers in general are very opinionated about everything. Programmers are opinionated about programming languages or editors and, and, and so forth. Programming communities that form around programming languages tend to have opinions about what language features are good, how you do things in this language, what the common idioms, patterns, techniques, approaches are. Uh, and some are more blunt about expressing those opinions than other, others are. I like to go and look at questions in say Stack Overflow that are of the form, how do I do this thing? Now, a frequent answer to how do I do this thing is, you shouldn't want to do that. Now that's often true, but you can tell a lot from how such questions are answered. Are they answered with, you shouldn't want to do that period, or you shouldn't want to do that uh, 
stupid. That's a lang. That's a uh, culture that's going to expect more of you from a learner and expo expect more work from you to understand a language. If you have a language where how do I do X provokes the the response, well, you could do X in this way, but actually in this language we tend to think that you should do this other thing that's the accomplishes the same goal as X, but is different. And here's how you would do that. That I think is a language that is friendly, friendlier to outsiders. Okay, so I'm now gonna start and talk uh, about the four different languages, six different languages. And what I want to do right now is look at my phone to see what time it is. Cause I, in all the, problems getting started. I didn't uh, set my timer, so I don't know how long I have to go. Now I do. Um, before introducing the languages, I want to make a disclaimer. Like I said, I've been programming pretty much exclusively in functional languages for 11 or 12 years. That's when I started learning Clojure. I haven't used Clojure for seven years. The language may have, the, I've probably missed changes in the language. I've probably missed changes in the closure culture. So things I say about closure are not completely out of date, but they might be out of date. So don't take this as you know, absolute certainty. Uh, investigate for yourself. Similarly, I haven't been using Elm for about two or three years, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start. Our six languages are, the first two are gonna be statically typed languages. They're going to be pure languages. That is, uh, they're not going to uh, allow workarounds for language features like say immutability. If you're gonna use these languages, you, you, you follow the rules. So Haskell, I want to point out first, so Haskell is an old functional programming language. That is to say, it's one of, of these particular languages. This is the oldest one. I think it's 25 or 35. I'm not sure how many years old since it started. Haskell is the most heavily mathematical language, and as such, it's the one that you really need to learn in a systematic manner. I have read a, a variety of Haskell books, but I haven't read all of them. The one that I, at this point, would recommend you look at is Haskell Programming from First Principles. As the title suggests, it starts at the beginning and works its way forward in a math book style way. Take a look at it. Uh, there may be other books that suit you better, but do try to learn it from a book, is my opinion. Um, Haskell is a back end language. Uh, there is an extension that lets it compile into JavaScript. A lot of these languages that are back end languages have that. My opinion is those with exceptions I'll note are really for visionaries. And I'm talking here, uh, I, I think to pragmatists, don't try to learn Haskell and use it to compile to the browser all at once. Learn Haskell in a backend context first. Haskell, I think, uh, ironically, given its age, probably has the most gaps in the whole product. Haskell documentation is, doesn't exactly have a reputation for being super friendly for beginners. Uh, if you rely a lot on documentation, as opposed to asking people questions, you might wanna give that, uh, you might wanna look at that. Haskell is a, a very opinionated language. It's opinionated about a, a, a largish number of things. If you have problems in Haskell, 
you should expect to do more work figuring those problems out and have relatively less success in being able to get people to help you by Stack Overflow or Slack or what have you. Um, Elm is a different language. It is a front-end language explicitly and only runs on the front end. It's a language for people who want to write primarily single page applications in a, uh, a language that's not JavaScript, though it does compile down to JavaScript, connects into the JavaScript uh, ecosystem and so on and so forth. So Elm it was created by Evan CZ is the person who created it. And essentially he took out all the parts of Haskell that he didn't think were necessary, absolutely necessary, and uh, tailored the result to the web. So this is a very minimalist language and as opposed to Haskell. Uh, I learned Elm before there were any books on Elm. I learned it when it was a language for visionaries. I don't actually know, uh, there are now books and courses and everything on Elm. I don't know anything about them because I hadn't read them. So it's a front end language. I think it's good in whole product. It's of course famous for its error messages. Um, it has fewer opinions. The community has fewer opinions than Haskell community, but it holds those opinions strongly. It is, I think, uh, make goes, people in the community go out of their way to help beginners. In fact, I saw a tweet not too long ago that I think uh, represents a good learning path. This person, uh, tried to learn Haskell, had a lot of trouble learning Haskell from a book, later on went to learn Elm, and then eventually came back to Haskell. So I think Elm is a good stepping stone to Haskell. In fact, uh, I started writing a book whose goal was to, to teach Elm as and then transition to teaching PureScript, which is a language for the front end that is equivalent to Haskell. It's the, uh, uh, another derivative of Haskell, but this one leaves in a lot of the complexity and subtlety of Haskell. Um, unfortunately, I realized that PureScript, I was hoping that PureScript would become a whole product and I would be the first book that was really tailored to pragmatists learning PureScript, uh, especially those who like to learn by building software. But I became convinced that PureScript is not going to be a pragmatist language as opposed to a visionary language in the near future. Uh, so I gave up on the book, but there are about 400 drafts of um, pages, 400 pretty good first draft pages on Elm in this book. I don't necessarily think it's a better program, a better book than any other book because I haven't read any other books. The advantage of this to you is uh, it's free, so it doesn't hurt you anything to try it. By the way, I will have uh, a final page that has all these books and links. Okay, I'm gonna go on now to two other languages. These are statically typed. They are less pure. For example, both F Sharp and Scala let you program in a functional style, but also have support for programming in uh, a more object-oriented style. They both allow you to uh, cheat and mutate, change data in place if you really, really need to, which Haskell and Elm are, are much less likely to let you do that. 
Uh, my problem in recommending them is I have not written a program at all in either one of them. Um, I don't know what learning style. So F sharp is a language that lives on the Microsoft ecosystem primarily, not exclusively, but it was developed uh, by Microsoft people to run on the C sharp virtual machine to interoperate with C sharp. So if you're a Microsoft shop going from C sharp to F sharp is a kind of natural transition. Similarly, Scala runs on the Java ecosystem, runs on the Java virtual machine. So if you already program in Java, it makes a natural choice. Uh, F sharp, the learning style, I don't know. Uh, my impression is probably both will work. It's a backend language. There's a variation called Fable that targets the front end that people have successfully built commercial products using. My brief glance makes me think it's more of a visionary language. There's not as much documentation, so on and so forth. Uh, so I'd stick to the back end. Uh, as far as I know, it's a whole product well integrated into Microsoft ecosystem. Um, attitude, I don't know anything about the community. I follow some people in the community. Seems from what I can tell, they're nice people, friendly people. They're enthusiastic about helping beginners. So that's what I know. Scala, oh, sorry, a book, the book I would recommend. It's the only F-sharp book I've read, uh, but I'd recommend this book, Domain Modeling Made Functional by Scott Blaschen. Um, the nice thing about this book is it both teaches you the language for programming and teaches you how to use it as a modeling language for business type applications. So that makes it kind of a unique book. And I really like that approach. Uh, Scala, the impression I get is that this is a language you probably want to learn systematically versus uh, the way I tend to learn languages. Uh, it's a back-end language. Again, there's a thing that compiles to JavaScript. I wouldn't start on it. Uh, is it a whole product? I think the answer is yes, but Scala 3 is a, a fairly substantial rewrite, uh, uh, upgrade of Scala. And doing some browsing, it looks like some of the pieces you'd expect in a whole product maybe aren't there yet, like some documentation hasn't been updated and so on and so forth. Attitude, I don't know anything about really. Uh, Scala has a reputation for being kind of a nasty community. However, I asked two people who work in Scala and they said they've made a lot of progress in making it a more friendly, welcoming community. And Scala 3 has, has been a big help in that. Uh, I have no idea what to read if you want to learn Scala. Okay, dynamically typed languages are Clojure and Elixir. Clojure is a language that targets the Java virtual machine. It's a Lisp style language, so it doesn't look familiar to people um, who haven't used a Lisp in the past, which is a barrier to some people. Um, don't think it should be, but it is a barrier to some people. Elixir is a language that runs on the Erlang virtual machine. Erlang is a language that was developed for use in telephone switches, high reliable telephone switches. It's been around for more than 25 years, I'm sure. Uh, you have used Erlang if you've used like an, a money machine to take out money, you've probably used Erlang and thus the Erlang virtual machine. Elixir compiles to the Erlang virtual machine, but it's a language that looks a lot more like Ruby than Erlang, which is a peculiar looking language. Um, both Clojure and Elixir are suitable for both 
learning styles? Is there someone about to talk? Yeah, it was me. I was just waiting for you to make a natural pause and to tell you that we are over five minutes. And maybe oh, no. you can No, that's okay. That's that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I don't want to interrupt you. Just maybe to wrap it up here, and then you can continue on the, your Q and A session because there are also some questions for you over there. Okay, I will. I will wrap up this language, this okay. slide, and then sure. I will go away. I'm sorry that. Uh, That's okay. That's okay. Um, when I'm sitting and looking at a tel at a screen, I tend to talk. My. <laughs> I tend to go long. Sorry about that. That's okay. No problem. It was faster yesterday. Um, so closure. Uh, I started closure when there were was only one book on closure. I've read two books on closure. The one of those two I liked most was the first edition of this book, The Joy of Closure. It's now up to its second edition. I have the second edition. I've never read it. Um, there are lots of closure books these days. Um, so. This happens to be one of them. Oh, um, whoops. Uh, it does happen that I wrote a book on closure, functional programming for the object oriented programmer. It's actually uh, kind of tailored to people who like the learn just in time style, uh, though it tries to be systematic, but it also, uh, works through building a large-ish um, system to give you that feel of building a large system enclosure. Uh, the only thing I can definitely say about why it's better than other books is uh, I have a link at the last slide that if you follow that link, you get a free copy. Um, other books you have to pay for. Um, I have, I there were no Elixir books when I started Elixir, so I don't have any uh, recommendation. Uh, there, actually, there was one book, but it's now out of date. So I don't know uh, what books to recommend. Uh, so very quickly, Closure is notable because it comes with a dialogue called Closure Script, uh, which is um, runs in the browser. So you can use the same language on the front end and the back end that gives you the uh, you know, that that glorious case where you share code between your front end code and your back end code. Elixir is for the back end. They're both, I think, perfectly solid uh, whole products. You're perfectly safe in, for example, doing a web app in either one of these. Um, Closure is more opinionated. One of its stronger opinions, or at least it used to be, is that you should compose solutions out of pieces rather than getting a big solution. Um, whereas Elixir is less opinionated, has, for example, I think a more complete web app uh, experience in the Phoenix web framework than Clojure has in its uh, web framework. Uh, check that before you believe me though. I think it's less opinionated. Elixir has good error messages. Uh, community is more tailored to beginners. Uh, they're very much tailored to beginners. So um, I won't talk through this slide. I really think that when it comes down to closure versus Elixir, a lot of it is about looking at features that are not, that are in the languages that are not specifically about functional programming, uh, but are other features. So I'll, if someone asks about that, I will talk about that in the other session. Uh, otherwise, personal strategies, if people are interested in personal strategies, I'll go through that slide. Um, and I'll also go through the company strategies. Someone has to ask me the question. Uh, if you do that, I'll answer it. Uh, and here are the books. And I guess we can leave this up. Okay, good. Uh, perhaps just to don't over rush over the last couple of slides, maybe um, our audience will have some questions about them. 
So right. um, let's make a short break for you and for us, and then to go to the, you will receive another link, and we will go to the agile stage to go through the couple of last slides that you had. And uh, as I said, we had a couple of questions for you on the Q and A on Match About. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, Brian. For all of you who want to keep. Uh, asking Brian questions and to listen to the rest of his session, go to the Agile stage. Uh, we will continue in uh, 15 minutes there. So thank you again, Brian, and see you in a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye.